All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories, number 59, for February 2024. Black History Month, three more black pioneers. is a National Historic Landmark, an Arboretum, a Sculpture Garden, a Nature Preserve, and an active cemetery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It opened in 1836, and it remains a popular visiting spot for tens of thousands of visitors every year. Its sister cemetery, Laurel Hill West, located across the Schuylkill River in Bala Kinwood, was founded in 1869. It has a history and a population of its own. I am Dr. Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine at Temple University in Philadelphia, volunteer tour guide at Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West, and volunteer podcaster. The black population of Philadelphia has been a vibrant part of the city's community since colonial days. The Great Migration, which started around 1910, brought millions of African Americans to the industrial north, many of whom settled in Philly. Sarah Anderson was born in Florida, where she lived her life in Philadelphia. She was one of the most effective Congress people of her day. She gained respect and admiration from both sides of the aisle for her remarkable 17 years in the State House. Samuel L. Evans, also born in Florida, never held office in Philadelphia, but he gained the nickname the Godfather of Black Philadelphia. And when he died at 105 years of age, his wake was at City Hall. Winnie Harris was the woman you wanted for your next door neighbor. During her years of service to the Powelton Village section of the city, she is responsible for the planting of more than 1,000 trees, whose branches all hung a little lower on the day that she was murdered. These three black pioneers are featured in this month's episode of All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories number 59, for February 2024. Three more black pioneers. Sarah A. Anderson, 1901-1992. From the earliest U.S. population statistics in 1780 until 1910, more than 90% of the African American population lived in the American South and made up most of the population in three southern states. Louisiana, until about 1890, was black majority. South Carolina, until the 1920s and Mississippi until the 1930s. Many Southern African Americans came north in what came to be known as the Great Migration. Between 1910 and 1970, an estimated six million African Americans moved out of the rural Southern United States to the urban Northeast, Midwest, and West. Although some came by private car or even boat, most came by train. Because of the huge railway grid across the country, Southerners tended to end up at about the same longitude as when they were in the South. If you started in Florida or the Carolinas or Virginia, you're probably going to end up in Philadelphia, the closest big city to the South, or New York. Whereas African Americans from Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas tended to end up in St. Louis, Chicago, and Detroit 
and other Midwestern cities. And some adventurous souls ended up on the West Coast, especially Los Angeles. The Great Migration was really no different from any other time in history when large groups of people seek a better life for themselves and their families. It was substantially caused by poor economic and social conditions due to prevalent racial segregation and discrimination in the southern states, where Jim Crow laws were upheld. Continued threats of lynching motivated some of the migrants, as African Americans searched for a society where they could live and flourish and feel comfortable. Now, lynching was not just localized to the South. A handful of lynchings took place in Pennsylvania, as many as 14. It may be more like 10 or 12. The numbers are a little sketchy. The most notorious, however, was the hideous case of Zachariah Walker. He was a steel worker who'd recently moved to Coatesville in Chester County to work in a steel mill. Walker was accused of killing a security guard and he was being held in the local hospital. On 13 August 1911, an angry mob dragged him from the hospital and took him about a quarter mile out of town. Walker is said to have cried, For God's sake, give a man a chance. I killed Rice in self-defense. Don't give me no crooked death just because I'm not white. His pleas fell on deaf ears. And in a field just outside of Coachville, the mob started a bonfire, and they threw Zachariah Walker in. Three times he attempted to crawl out, only to be pushed back until he didn't move anymore. There was a crowd of at least 2,000 men, women, and children who witnessed Walker's ordeal. Some say it was as many as 5,000, and many of them waited until the embers started to cool so they could collect a bone fragment or another souvenir of their day out. As black folks moved north, they established their own communities within the large cities, usually segregated from the white population, but complete with their own cultural, social, political, and economic influence bases. Racism has forced darker-skinned individuals to set up parallel societies to majority whites, but with far more similarities than differences. Blacks ended up in major conflict with other minority groups, especially the Irish, in competing for jobs and housing. And there were race riots throughout the 19th and the early 20th century. I will eventually talk about the 1838 riots and the conflagration of Pennsylvania Hall in a future podcast. That building was burnt down four days after it opened. This was happening in concert with the development of organizations to assist the black population to accomplish its goals, particularly the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. It was founded in Springfield, Illinois in 1909. The first Philadelphia chapter of the NAACP was founded in 1912, partly to assist the influx of black southern migrants arriving in the city. With the onset of the Great War, European immigration plummeted and more blacks streamed into the great industrial centers like Philadelphia to take manual labor jobs in both the streets and in the factories. So by 1920, the black population of Philadelphia had ballooned to 134,000 people. This was a 50% increase from 10 years earlier. But, just as in the South, there were so-called Jim Crow laws that kept African Americans from advancing in the North. In Philadelphia in 1917 and 1918, white mobs, including soldiers in military uniform, attacked black migrants three different times for seeking jobs in previously all-white industrial workplaces and housing in all-white neighborhoods. These riots left two people dead and scores injured. And then, when white soldiers returned to their civilian jobs, they reclaimed their good-paying jobs at the factories, and blacks found themselves pushed out of the industrial jobs. Now, it wasn't just the white folks who were looking warily at these mostly young, 
uneducated immigrants. Philadelphia had a well-established black community of its own that dated back to colonial days. Enslaved Africans arrived in the area that was to become Philadelphia as early as 1639. By 1765, there were roughly 1,500 black Philadelphians, of whom 100 were free. When the American Revolution broke out in 1775, enslaved individuals were one-twelfth of the roughly 16,000 people who lived in Philadelphia. Black people served on both sides. There were some loyalists, there were some patriots during the American Revolution. The Pennsylvania Abolition Society was founded by white Quakers, although it did eventually become a biracial organization. By 1811, most of Philadelphia's black population were living as free men and women, but some remained enslaved until the 1840s. The free black community was joined by many runaways from the South and refugees from the Haitian Revolution in the late 1790s and early 1800. And by 1830, there were 15,000 black Philadelphians. By 1850, that number had grown to 20,000s. African-American Philadelphians joined the USCT, the United States Colored Troops, in regiments that fought for the North. Streetcar segregation ended throughout the state in 1867, although African-Americans would wait another 75 years before they were allowed to work on the streetcars as drivers or conductors. By 1880, the black population of Philadelphia was 32,000, and there were about 300 black-owned businesses in this city of nearly 850,000. Assimilation was incredibly difficult for the new arrivals from the South. The Great Migration funneled more people toward the city of brotherly love, and during the 1920s, Philadelphia's black population grew another 64% to 219,600. Now, depression did slow this down to a trickle. Fortunately, during the 1980s, many local oral historians, usually associated with universities, interviewed dozens of people who had made their trek from the south during the migration. You can find amazing eyewitness accounts of this time on the webpage www.goinnorth.org. That's not going north, it's go in, G-O-I-N, go in north. Think of it as three words, dot O-R-G. Click on Oral Histories Interviews and have your ears opened. But leaders of the thriving black community did emerge. Maryland-born Crystal Bird Fawcett became the first female African-American state legislator in 1938. She represented the 18th District of Philadelphia, which was primarily a white neighborhood at the time. In the early days of the Great Migration, one of these southern migrants was a young woman named Sarah A. Anderson, born 25 January 1901 in Jacksonville, Florida. Her father, Dr. Harry Anderson, was the first practicing black dentist in Florida. The family migrated to Philadelphia in time for Sarah to attend and graduate from Philadelphia High School for Girls and later from the Philadelphia Normal School. Following her studies, Sarah became an elementary school teacher in the Philadelphia public school system. She married a politically active podiatrist named Dr. Adolphus W. Anderson. I can't find any statements saying that they were related, second cousins or something like that. It may have just been they both had the same last name. And they had six children together. Despite being a full-time teacher and a full-time mom, Sarah got heavily involved in Philadelphia politics. She was a member of the 30th Ward Democratic Committee, a member of the 44th Ward Executive Committee, and a member of District 1 Democratic Executive Committee. She also served as an inspector for the Philadelphia Elections Board, a judge in the 24th Division Election Board, and a legislative consultant for the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. In 1955, Sarah Anderson was elected as a Democrat to represent Philadelphia's 25th district, and she served from 1955 to 1968. 
After redistricting, she represented the 193rd Legislative District from 1969 to 1972. She spent 17 years as an elected official in the House of Representatives. As you could probably tell so far, Sarah Anderson was not a woman to sit on her hands and wait for things to happen. During her time in office, Anderson focused much of her legislation on sickle cell anemia treatment, veterans affairs, discrimination, children's vaccinations. She was the sponsor of Act 17 in 1959 that called for children to be vaccinated prior to starting kindergarten. She played a key role in the establishment of the Junior College, which ultimately became the Community College of Philadelphia. And in 1965, she sponsored a fair housing bill. In 1963, there was an article in the Pittsburgh Courier with the headline, Mrs. Anderson is Legislator of the Year. Quote, Les Afrian and Interborough Civics voted Honorable Sarah A. Anderson of Harrisburg and Philadelphia Legislator of the Year in their poll of distinguished citizens. The mother of six, a dynamic and convincing speaker with walls laden with citations and awards, is the first member of her sex to sit on a vital military affairs committee in the state of Pennsylvania. She was alternate at large in the 1956 National Democratic Convention, delegate at large in the 1960 Democratic Convention, and among her national activities, was one of the conferees at the White House Conference on Full Utilization of the Negro in the Navy. She sponsored legislation that became Act 56 of 1969, which prohibited employment discrimination based on race, religion, ancestry, sex, or national origin. In 1971, Act 121 was enacted, which provided funds for the funerals of deceased veterans by providing gravestone markers, flags, and other items associated with veteran funerals. In 1972, she was honored by the Pennsylvania Commission on the Status of Women for her sponsorship of the Pennsylvania Equal Rights Amendment and other efforts for women's rights in the states. Other successes. (laughs) Sarah secured the passage of legislation which made kidney dialysis services accessible in underserved communities via the use of mobile units. She helped raise awareness regarding sickle cell anemia. She helped secure the passage of legislation to increase funding for mental health treatment services. She supported efforts which helped improve the quality of life for blind and visually impaired residents across Pennsylvania. Sarah was a quiet but extremely effective legislator. She sought neither glory nor personal gain. She made the news on Valentine's Day of 1969 when she was mugged a half block from her Philadelphia home. She was 67 years old and she was hit from behind. Her purse and watch were stolen and her coat was ripped. She was dragged into an alley where she was found unconscious, but she did seem to recover uneventfully. Sarah Anderson was also the first black woman to preside over the General Assembly, and she served as chairwoman of the Health and Welfare Committee for four years. Now, while serving in that role in 1970, this is three years before Roe v. Wade, she was at the center of debates about legalizing abortion in Pennsylvania. House Bill 2393 was a package of political dynamite that included the concept that abortion was solely between a woman and her physician. Before it came to a vote, the bill was disarmed and buried in the House. Anderson had co-sponsored the bill, and she'd been planning to hold hearings on the bill that month. Now, the reason that was given for pulling the bill was the volatility of upcoming elections, despite the House being controlled by Democrats. Sarah said, well, I'll resubmit the bill in the next session of Congress, provided that I run again. But her 17-year career ended the next year. She decided not to stand for re-election. 
The Philadelphia Daily News announced on 16 October that, quote, the petite grandmother announced in a letter to Philadelphia Democratic Chairman Peter J. Camille that she would not run for re-election in 1972. She bowed out early because of an upcoming redistricting fight. She said, we're going to lose one, maybe two seats. It is early. And I thought it would make redistricting easier if I took action now. Since I'm an incumbent, they would have tried to protect my seat. She was recovering from an unknown illness at that time. Yet she had become the center of attention during an income tax battle when the Democratic leadership sent state troopers to bring her from her sick bed in Philadelphia to the House chamber in Harrisburg, where she cast the decisive vote several times. At the time of her retirement, Speaker Herbert Feynman explained that Sarah is deeply admired and respected by both sides of the aisle for her gentleness, her finesse, for her thoughtfulness, for the cheer she always spreads. I have always found it utterly amazing that in spite of the many misfortunes that have stricken her, she was always of good courage and we have come to love her for this courage as well as for her fairness. Sarah's husband, Dr. Adolphus A. Anderson, Sr., died in 1965 at age 70. He was a graduate of Temple University College of Podiatry. He was also a veteran of the First World War, and he held numerous offices in the VFW and the American Legion. During the Second World War, he served as chairman of the War Price and Rationing Board of Philadelphia. Following the Korean War, he was supervisor of the Military Affairs Department of the state. However, when he died, he chose to be interred at Arlington National Cemetery. Sarah outlived him by 27 years. She died on 11 December 1992 at age 91. By then, she'd been retired for 20 years, but she'd continued to receive awards and certificates of appreciation for her long years of public service. At her death, she was survived by three daughters, 17 grandchildren, and 19 great-grandchildren. Two daughters, a son, and her husband had preceded her in death. She's interred with a simple, flat bronze plaque in the Garden of Memories near the Belmont Gate. A daughter, Jean A. Mallory, died the next year and shares the same plot and the same marker. Sarah A. Anderson was one of those good people who served as a backbone of democracy. For 17 years, serving in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, she was responsible for doing good for thousands of citizens and neighbors. She lived a long, useful life, primarily for the benefit of others. Winifred Harris, 1951, 2016. Throughout Philadelphia, you will find people who are the glue who hold their neighborhoods together. Winnie Harris was one of those neighbors. She lived on Holly Street in the Powelton Village section of the city. Holly Street runs parallel between 41st and 42nd Streets from Lancaster and Mantua. It's a distance only of a few blocks. Powelton Village is a neighborhood of mostly Victorian, mostly twin homes in West Philadelphia. It is a National Historic District that's part of University City. It takes its name from the Powell family, 17th and 18th century Welsh colonialists who held extensive estates in the area. Samuel Powell twice served as mayor of Philadelphia from 1775 to 76 and again from 1789 to 1790. That means he was the last mayor of colonial Philadelphia and the first mayor to serve after the United States gained its independence from England. Before 1860, the area we now call Powelton was a combination of farmland, pasture, and forest with few buildings. The southern part was owned by the Powell family, the northern part by the Bingham Baring family. It wasn't until the 1850s that the estates were sold and the area was surveyed and parceled and roads were paved. When trolley lines started up in the late 1800s, 
the area opened to urbanization, and Powelton soon became a choice residential spot for Philadelphia industrial tycoons. Powelton's luster began to wane by the 1920s, and by the 1940s, the neighborhood was populated by low-income families. In the 1960s, the village was home to many members of the counterculture movement. As you will hear in the next episode of Biographical Bites from Bala, Vince Liepert, who had changed his name to John Africa, moved to this neighborhood of blacks and whites and straights and gays and students and professors and hippies and young professionals. And that was so he could establish his organization known as MOVE. You will hear about them in a couple of weeks. Residential streets are mostly lined with Victorian twin houses, some of which are traditional family homes, others have been subdivided into apartments. Detached houses, row houses, apartment buildings all dot the neighborhood. The southern end of Powelton Village includes property owned by Drexel University. Many students from Drexel live off campus in Powelton's urban structured row house apartments because of the short walk to campus. As the neighborhood caught in change, Powelton Village had its share of rundown property that was being ignored by the city. Neighbors slowly but steadily took over the abandoned lots on tiny Holly Street and converted them into a community garden. And at the head of this movement was Winifred Winnie Harris. Winnie had moved to Powelton in the late 1970s. She rented the house and soon became a fixture. A native Philadelphian, Winnie Harris was the second oldest of seven children. She graduated from Bach Vocational High School with honors in 1970. And this was at a time when only 25% of African Americans 25 years of age or above had completed high school. Her high school teacher noted on her report card, these grades are college material. Well, after she completed high school, Winnie gave birth to her first and only child. And in 1977, after ongoing disagreements with her landlord about needed property repairs, she purchased the property with the support of her father. She became a homeowner at a time when only 41% of African Americans were able to do so. She stayed in school. She earned a degree in interior design from Drexel University. She was only the second person in her extended family to finish college. She raised a daughter. She also raised a niece and a nephew in her modest home. And they eventually moved to homes of their own, and Winnie had the house to herself. She had an entrepreneurial spirit. In 1993, she was featured in the Inquirer as one of the four graduates of a 12-week micro-enterprise class given by the Women's Enterprise Resource Center, or WORK. Harris was 41 at the time. And she sounded like she was ready to conquer the world. Dressed in a blue print dress and a white blazer, she told the Inquirer's reporter, I'm meeting with a client. I have a couple of phone calls to make. Now that I have a business plan, it's, oh man, I'm ready for the next step. I can accomplish anything. And Winnie had used her degree in interior design to work for Thomas Jefferson University, but she was laid off without much warning. I was unable to determine her success at being an entrepreneur, but the next time I find her in the Inquirer is in July of 2006 in an article about her gardening. Winnie Harris waters her West Philadelphia garden the old-fashioned way. She fills a gallon milk jug at the sink, lugs it outside, and dumps it on her flowers and vegetables. Not the easiest way to do it, not the most efficient, certainly not the most cost-effective. During peak gardening season last summer, her water bill went from $29 a month to $99. The article then tells about Harris's planting more drought-resistant perennials, along with her usual annuals on the site of two abandoned row houses on the short 300 block of Holly Street. The property had been renamed the Holly Street Neighbors Community Garden, and Harris was the person most responsible for making it successful. In working with drought-resistant perennials, she was able to cultivate coneflower, salvia, a few cacti and herbs like spearmint and thyme along with some annuals. She was most excited 
about being granted permission to hook up an $11 soaker hose to a city fire hydrant at the end of the block. Winnie was happy with her neighbors, her family, and her life. She gave her two-story brownstone row house a purple door. And when she turned 65 in September of 2016, she was locked into her role as a gardener and a civic leader in her neck of the woods. She was the acting executive director and volunteer coordinator at UC Green and had been responsible for planting more than 1,000 trees in Philadelphia. Her Green Corps provided local high school students environmental education and leadership training during the summer months. She was always easy to spot. She was the one with the denim jacket and the kerchief on her head for her hair. Another longtime volunteer and close friend, Mark Wigenveld, said, Winnie was the master of detail who organized thousands of tree plantings on Saturday mornings in West Philadelphia for many years. The volunteers always arrived to find snacks to get them started, and they never went home without pizza and drinks. No tree planting was ever truly over for Winnie until every last shovel, broom, and pickaxe had been brought back from the neighborhoods, accounted for, and returned to the tool shed. She would push a shopping cart up and down the streets of Philadelphia to see what discarded refuse she could repurpose for the garden. She even co-authored an article published in the journal Urban Forestry and Urban Greening, Volume 14, Issue 4, 2015, pages 1174 to 1182. Its title, Stewardship Matters, Case Studies in Establishment Success of Urban Trees. But on Friday... 3 February 2017, Winnie's neighbor, Elizabeth Waring, noticed that a window was open in Winnie's house. The neighbor investigated, and the door was locked. She put in a call to Winnie's nephew, who came to investigate. He confirmed that the house was locked, so he called the police. They arrived about 8.20, and they found Winnie unresponsive in a second-floor front bedroom. She was pronounced dead at 8.57 p.m. Winnie Harris had been shot three times. Powelton Village was plunged into mourning. Who in the world would want to hurt Winnie? She was a pillar of the community. She showed everyone how to live a better, greener life. Winifred Harris was interred at Laurel Hill West, appropriately under a holly tree. Elex Opaka in the Lansdowne section. There's a small bronze plaque. It's right by the road. You can see it from the road if you're walking in that section. But the police were stumped, despite the $20,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. In late March, police released a surveillance video of two men who'd been walking near Harris's home. One man was described as black, of average height and muscular build. In the video, he appears to be holding a gun in one hand as he runs into an alleyway, and then he hides the gun in his pocket. Well, when no arrests were made, Winnie's friends and family took matters into their own hands. One of her best friends was Sandra Fullwood, who was a retired Philadelphia police officer. She'd met Harris in the late 1990s. I couldn't understand why the houses in the 4800 block were worth much more than the ones on our block, Fullwood recalled of the home she purchased in 1996. We were told to go see Winnie Harris at UC Green. She helped us plant 17 trees. The property values came up, and in the springtime it was so beautiful. It was all because of Winnie. Fullwood and Mark Wagenfeld created a Justice for Winnie flyer, and they distributed copies throughout the city. It even included a QR code, which people could scan to see the police surveillance video. An estimated 15,000 flyers were spread all over the city. On Monday, 9 October 2017, more than eight months after the murder, Philadelphia arrested a North Philadelphia man for the murder of Winnie Harris, along with robbery, burglary, conspiracy, and weapons offenses. The suspect, whose name I will not repeat, 
was taken into custody at the Delaware County Prison, where he was behind bars on an unrelated matter. Now, this was one of two men who admitted they, quote, broke into the wrong house, end quote, when they went to Winnie's home back in February. This was also one of the men in the surveillance video. The investigating officer said Winnie wasn't the target. They apparently killed Miss Harris in cold blood. It was completely unnecessary. Now, the accused man had been arrested on 13 April on aggravated assault, burglary, and criminal trespass charges. That's why he was in jail. He'd also served time for burglary, and he'd been arrested four times on drug possession charges from March 2000 to January 2011. On Monday, 8 April 2017, the two men charged in the fatal shooting of Winnie Harris pleaded guilty to third-degree murder and related offenses rather than face trial. They admitted they had planned to rob Harris's next-door neighbor, who they thought had drugs and money at the house. The man who pulled the trigger was sobbing and leaning back in his chair as he told the judge, I'm ready. Yes, yes, I am. I'm just hurting, ma'am. Had they been convicted of first- or second-degree murder, they would have been sentenced to mandatory life in prison without parole. As it was, he was sentenced to 35 to 70 years. He was 41 at the time. The shooter volunteered even more disturbing information to Winnie's family. He said the house was dark when he went in. He couldn't see. But when he entered Harris's bedroom, she had armed herself with a baseball bat, and she knocked the gun out of his hand. Now, one account has the gun discharging when she struck out. But remember, she was shot three times. This guy said, I could have run out of that house, but I wanted to get that gun out of there. It was only now that police revealed they'd found a baseball bat in the hallway outside of Harris's room. There was a third person later arrested. I could not determine her disposition or whether she was sentenced. At least two of Winifred Harris's killers are currently behind bars. Winnie is interred at Laurel Hill West, and her contributions to the city of Philadelphia are many. At her death, one of her volunteers noted that the tree branches of Philadelphia seemed to hang a little lower that day. 2,894 trees were planted in Philadelphia during her tenure with UC Green, and she was responsible for many of them. Her investment in Philadelphia will be enjoyed for decades by thousands of Philadelphians who never knew her name. You know her name now. It is Winifred Winnie Harris. Time to take a break before I tell you about the last person today. We have a big schedule coming up at both East and West for February. On Sunday, February 4th at 1 p.m., it's a Tuba Shabbat gathering and tree tour at Laurel Hill West. It's a short tour of Laurel Hill West Wintry Arboretum in celebration of Tuba Shabbat, often called the Jewish New Year for the Trees. Go ahead and join us for that. That should be fun. I'm doing a virtual Sacred Spaces and Storied Places next Wednesday, February 7th at 6.30. There's no charge for this. You can watch it for no charge. You do need to get a link from us, however, so you have to register. All of this can be done at laurelhillphl.com slash events. There's a Hot Spots and Storied Plots tour, a general tour taking place at Laurel Hill East on Saturday, February 10th from 10 until noon. Uh, Rich Wilhelm is going to be your guide for that. And Rich always gives good tours, lots of fun, lots of good information. And we got some special tours for around Valentine's Day. Till Death Do Us Part, Love Stories of Laurel Hill East. This is one of the most popular tours every year. Gwen Kaminsky gives this. The Spirit of Valentine's Day with the love stories. The little known stories of people like Mary Peterson 
and others and their lives of love for one another. Again, that one is Saturday, February 10th at 1 p.m. at Laurel Hill East. There are simultaneous events going on Saturday, February 17th at 9 a.m. at Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West. There is an ornithological tour, a great backyard bird count, no birding experience needed. Separate walks begin at 9 a.m. in the courtyard of Laurel Hill East and the funeral home at Laurel Hill West at the same time on both days. There's no fee for either of these. However, we do ask that you register in advance. You can do that on the website. Also, the same day, just an hour later at Laurel Hill West, all thorns and no roses. Love gone wrong at Laurel Hill West. You talk about a good tour. This one is so much fun. Sarah Hamill gives this tour and tells about love gone wrong, and the stories she tells are absolutely amazing. Again, that one is Saturday the 17th, 10 a.m., at Laurel Hill West. There's another Hot Spots tour, a general tour, on Friday, February 23rd, from 10 a.m. until noon. Jessica Heichel is giving that tour. And a general tour at Laurel Hill West, Sacred Spaces and Storied Places, the next day, Saturday, February 24th, at 10 a.m. Pamela McMahon is your host for that particular tour. Another theme tour on Sunday, the 25th. That is Black Trailblazers at Laurel Hill West. One o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, the 25th. Again, Sarah Hamill doing this wonderful tour. She's going to talk about Teddy Pendergrass and Raymond and Sadie Alexander and uh, Denny Hoggard and a whole lot of other folks that you should probably know who were buried at Laurel Hill West. The Boneyard Bookworms is on Leap Day. Thursday, February 29th, from 6 until 7.30. Virtual online book club. This month, the book is Lincoln in the Bardo. George Saunders' genre-breaking tale of characters, both living and dead, historical and invented. That ought to be a trip. So for February, a short month, we've got an awful lot going on. Take advantage of the tours, both live and the events online. I think you will learn things. I know you will learn things. And I'm pretty sure you're going to have a good time also. I remind you that Laurel Hill cemeteries are open from 7 a.m. until 5 p.m., seven days a week. And you can come experience them when you like and have fun looking around. It is more fun, and you'll learn a lot more if you've got a real live guide, though. You can become a friend of Laurel Hill. You'll get some discounts at the gift shop. You will get special tours, including inside the mausoleum tours, if you become a friend. All of that information is available at laurelhillphl.com. Okay, let's get back to the podcast. Samuel London Evans, 1902 to 2008. I am not the person who should write a biography of Sam Evans. I'm not a native of the area. I moved here in 1986, and my first several years were spent studying so I did very little to keep up with the news. I am not African American. I only started learning about Philadelphia's black political leaders after I'd been here for a few years. In the past, I have done podcasts about some early black leaders. Uh, Biographical Bites from Bala number 5 is about Philadelphia's first black power couple, Raymond Pace Alexander and Sadie T.M. Alexander, who are both interred in the South Lawn section. That podcast has been downloaded more than a thousand times. Biographical Bites from Bala number 12 is about C. Dolores Tucker, turbaned warrior for justice. In other Black History Month podcasts, I have talked about other African-American pioneers interred at Laurel Hill West. 
And I admit that before I started working on this podcast a few weeks ago, I knew nothing about Samuel London Evans. He was completely new to me. But the more I read in newspapers, the more questions I had. For instance, dozens of articles mention how Sam was an impresario. So I went to chat GPT and typed, tell me about the impresario, Samuel L. Evans. And I got a long paragraph. Quote, Samuel L. Evans was a prominent African-American theatrical impresario who produced and directed many plays, musicals, and operas in the United States and abroad. He was born in Philadelphia and began his career as a stage manager for the Lafayette Players, a black theater company. He later founded his own company, the Samuel L. Evans Players, which toured extensively in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Some of his notable works include Porgy and Bess, The Emperor Jones, The Green Pastures, and Carmen Jones. Evans also mentored many young actors and actresses such as Lena Horne, Harry Belafonte, and Sidney Poitier. He died in 1964 in New York City. Evans was the first African-American impresario to achieve international recognition and acclaim. That sounded amazing. It also didn't sound right. And it wasn't. Bing, ChatGPT, had told me about Samuel Lafayette Evans, who was born in Philadelphia in 1896, but he made his name in New York City. Now, Samuel London Evans, in the Mausoleum of Peace Community Mausoleum at Laurel Hill West, was born in 1902, somewhere near New Jacksonville, Florida. That was still the Deep South. It's only 37 years after the end of slavery, 26 years after the collapse of Reconstruction. Sam's grandfather was enslaved. One article says Sam was one of 11 children born to the Reverend Reuben Evans and his wife Penny. But another says that Sam's father Reuben had been dead for several months when his fifth child, Samuel London Evans, was born in a simple two-room frame house. Right away I knew I was in trouble, getting a lot of contrasting information. Sam claimed to have witnessed five lynchings before he was 10 years old. There is no record of him attending any public school. He worked on a tenant farm for 15 hours a day at the wage of 15 cents per day, where he harvested cotton, tobacco, sugar cane, and other crops for a company that owned the farm. He was big for his age. He worked nearly as hard as his older brothers. He ended up being well over six feet tall with a build like a football linebacker. At 12, Sam moved with his family to the city of Jacksonville, Florida, where he worked for a time unloading bricks, a job that bloodied his hands. He then worked as a dishwasher and a waiter for a hotel. And as a longshoreman in Tampa, before he headed north to New York City at age 17 while working as a deckhand on a freighter. Sam was overwhelmed by New York's noise and energy, and he stayed only three days before he moved to Philadelphia to live with his older brother Perry, who became the founding pastor of Faith Baptist Church in North Philadelphia. Sam found work with Midvale Steel Company in Philadelphia at the unheard of salary for a black man of $8 a day. He left the company a few years later after coming down with rheumatic fever. In one of the many interviews done later in his life, he said that he took classes here and there, but he could not remember what courses he had taken or where. He did remember going to what was later named the Philadelphia College of Bible. He said that his studies were mostly self-motivated. He would approach everyone that he knew who was getting a formal education. I would pump those guys and find out the books they were studying, and then I'd go out and get them and read them, read them over backwards. I'd take a book or the Constitution of the United States and read it five times. That kind of learning. 
He next worked as a porter for several retail businesses in Center City. The job that moved him in a direction that could not have been predicted, though, was at the Stark Piano Store at 12th and Chestnut Street. He was the janitor. He cleaned and he dusted. But he listened to the classical music that employees sometimes played on player pianos, and he fell in love with it. He said, This was my first exposure to classical music. One day the manager came over to me and instructed me to throw out a large box of player piano rolls. I requested his permission to keep them. He took the rolls home to his brother's house where there was a player piano and he played the rolls over and over. The first role he played was Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C sharp minor. Also in the box, Piano Rolls of Music by Franz Liszt. Sam would try to play along, but his long, thin fingers failed to master the piano. Instead, 20 years later, he became a successful impresario and brought world-class entertainment to the Academy of Music. I found ads in the Inquirer that touted his accomplishments of bringing the mime Marcel Marceau, mezzo-soprano Grace Bumbry, who only died last year, but Sam brought them to Philadelphia. In the interviews that I found, he skimmed quickly through the Depression, but he recalled taking a police examination and passing it. But then a rheumatic fever-like illness placed him in a hospital, and he never pursued the police department position. Sam Evans was working his way into a leadership position for the black community of Philadelphia, despite never running for public office. There's very little about him in local newspapers until the 1950s. We know that he married Edna Hoy in 1926. They were together for 62 years until her death. He had grown into an impressive six-footer with ramrod straight posture, who did toe touches and deep knee bends daily until just shortly before his death. He was jailed briefly in the 1930s. He lived on North 13th Street, and he was arrested for picketing North Philadelphia stores that refused to hire African Americans and for protesting Nazi activism in his community. Like many people with left political leanings, he was branded as a PAF, a premature anti-fascist. In an unpublished biographical sketch, which I have not been able to locate, Evans related, over 60% of the consumers on Columbia Avenue were minorities, yet they could not get jobs in the stores or sit on the first floor of the theaters. His demonstration against a group called the Nazi Bund who met regularly at Turner Hall at Broad Street and Columbia Avenue, which is now Cecil B. Moore Avenue, took place in about 1934, and his protest nearly caused a riot. It led to the arrest of 75 young people and Mr. Evans. At trial, a judge ruled that Mr. Evans and others had a constitutional right to picket. It was a double victory for Mr. Evans, as the street protests effectively ended the Nazi meetings at Turner Hall. He explained in a letter that he wrote to the Philadelphia Daily News in 2002. He stated, We Americans would rather ride in an ox cart or a covered wagon in a democracy than in a Rolls Royce driven by a dictator. By the early 1940s, Mr. Evans was being referred to as a lieutenant of John B. Kelly, the brickwork contractor who had become a city Democratic chairman. Evans' first government job was at Philadelphia Coordinator for Black Activities for the U.S. Department of Physical Training in the Office of Civil Defense. But he saw an opportunity for more power, and Evans later defected to the Republican Party, which was dominant in the city. He was rewarded by the GOP State Administration, which in 1946 appointed him Secretary of the State Athletic Commission, a post which was traditionally reserved for black politicians. 
he became a Republican committeeman in the 20th Ward. There he was arrested for illegal voting assistance in 1950. But the tide in Philadelphia was turning toward Democrats and reform. Along the way, Sam Evans founded the world-renowned Philadelphia Coffee Concerts and the International Chamber of Orchestra Society. For 35 years, he produced chamber symphony orchestras and hosted classical artists from all over the world. In June 1960, he was mentioned in a newspaper article as one of the judges for a local music competition. The prize went to a 13-year-old from West Philadelphia named Andre Watts, who died just last year. In 1951 and 1952, Evans attended weekly New York University lecture courses on integrated concepts in science, philosophy, and education. When the Philadelphia Anti-Poverty Action Committee was organized in the mid-1960s, Evans emerged as the dominant character. Under his leadership, PAAC dispensed millions of dollars of anti-poverty funds without a taint of scandal. And this included $22 million to the Opportunities Industrialization Center of the Reverend Dr. Leon Sullivan, who had been catapulted to the Board of General Motors. Another article I read said, As an author, Evans wrote Nothing to Fear, a book about J. Robert Oppenheimer, who created the atomic bomb. Evans befriended and defended Oppenheimer against the attacks of Senator Joseph McCarthy. Okay, surely I thought this was another case of mistaken identity. And I felt somewhat vindicated when I went searching for evidence on Amazon.com No books by Samuel L. Evans. There were more than a half a dozen books with nothing to fear in the title. None were written by Evans, and none were about Oppenheimer. Yet, when I plugged the two names into Google, sure enough, there was a photo of Oppenheimer and Evans standing next to each other at a presentation ceremony of the Pyramid Club. The photo is from the Blockley Collection at Temple University. So I went back to newspapers.com, Oppenheimer Evans Pyramid Club. This time I did not put Philadelphia, and there it was. In November 1954, the Pyramid Club, an organization of 350 elite Philadelphia African Americans, honored Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer with its 1954 Achievement Award for, quote, unstinting devotion of his great gifts to the end of increasing man's knowledge, end quote. Many people were furious at the organization for awarding such a controversial figure. Only months before, he had been stripped of his security clearance over questions of his loyalty to the United States. And here he was getting an award from the Pyramid Club. Philadelphia newspapers did not even cover the event. The Pyramid Club was formed in November 1937 by African-American professionals for the, quote, cultural, civic, and social advancement of Negroes in Philadelphia, end quote. Its home at 1517 Girard Avenue was for professional African Americans who could pay the membership fee of $120 and monthly dues of $2.40. By the 1950s, it was, quote, Philadelphia's leading African American social club. And because African Americans were barred from many clubs and restaurants, the Pyramid Club became their watering hole. It had its own bar and its own restaurant. It hosted parties, social events, concerts by noted musicians such as Marian Anderson and Duke Ellington, speakers like Martin Luther King Jr. and J. Robert Oppenheimer. The Pyramid Club was the only exhibition space in Philadelphia at the time that was owned, operated, and controlled by African Americans. It ran an annual art exhibition from 1941 to 1957 that featured both local and 
national artists. The club played an important role within the African American community by connecting artists with middle and upper class professionals able to support their work. But the Pyramid Club dissolved in 1963 when the building was taken over by the city for non payment of employee taxes. It has been commemorated with a historical marker by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. There is currently a Pyramid Club. It's in the Rittenhouse section of Philadelphia. It is totally unrelated to this prior Pyramid Club. During the 1960s, Samuel Evans rejoined the Democratic Party. And in 1963, he was Philadelphia responsible for arranging transportation to Washington, D.C.'s gathering at the Lincoln Memorial on 28 August. A special train of stainless steel air-conditioned cars would carry marchers from Philadelphia for $7 each. It wasn't enough. He also needed to rent 285 buses. 85 organizations were represented among the 18,000 Philadelphians who made their way to the Capitol on that monumental day. And Sam Evans was in charge. In March 1964, Philadelphia Mayor James H.J. Tate appointed Samuel L. Evans to the city's Recreation Coordination Board. At this time, he was living in Jefferson Manor at 1046 West Jefferson Street. During President Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty, Evans was appointed Tsar of Philadelphia and was responsible for more than $350 million coming to the city, some of which went to establish the Head Start and the Get Set programs. Then, in 1970, talk began about the upcoming 200th birthday of our nation. The initial plans called for a World's Fair in Philadelphia. Sam Evans was appointed by the President of the United States, the Governor of Pennsylvania, and the Mayor of Philadelphia to organize the nation's 200th anniversary celebration. A year later, after researching the academic deficiencies still plaguing inner city and minority students, Evans founded the American Foundation for Negro Affairs, which is now known as the American Foundation for Nationality Affairs, AFNA. The AFNA National Education and Research Fund says that it has assisted more than 20,000 students to gain entry and ultimately graduate from hundreds of colleges, universities, medical, and law schools. Through Evans' vision, AFNA has produced more than 750 medical physicians, 550 lawyers, 96 PhDs, and 4,900 college graduates. In May 1971, the Daily News reported that a recent column stating that Samuel Evans received $25,000 annually for heading the Anti-Poverty Action Commission, quote, this was in error. In 30 years of civic and public affairs, Samuel L. Evans has never received a penny of compensation for his services, end quote. And a few months later, Evans was accused of misusing funds and personnel in promoting the bicentennial. In December 1971, Evans' AFNA was accused of not carrying through on a deal with the city. They'd staged a football game at JFK Stadium between Alcorn A&M and North Carolina Central University of Durham. And the massive horseshoe was less than one-fourth full. Evans explained, the city didn't give us a dime and we are asking the city to underwrite this. The city asked for $5,000 in stadium rental fee. The article also made it a point to say that Evans was being paid $65,000 a year for his position with the Bicentennial. 
Evans blamed this whole fiasco on, quote, a colonial system. They'll give you money as long as you don't get anywhere with it. Most foundations and individuals have restrictions. They give monies to containment programs, programs that keep the status quo. Evans also justified his $65,000 salary. I know more about organization backwards and forwards. I've been tried and tested. The average guy would have been destroyed under what I had to do. Many white men I meet are making $65,000 or $75,000 a year, and I don't see the knowledge they have at all. I think if I was white, I'd probably be the head of the organization making $100,000 or $150,000 a year. In May of 1972, the Philadelphia 1976 Bicentennial Corporation quietly started to disband after the rejection by the federal government of plans for an international exposition, and eight banks were left with $62,000 in debt. Yet there was a sidebar to this article that noted that Sam Evans had a contract with the corporation that virtually assured him he could not be fired and guaranteed him a year's salary in a lump payment. The Philadelphia Daily News had a field day in August 1972, it published their investigation of the committee, a now-defunct organization that spent more than $3 million in federal, state, and local tax money to wine and dine, sleep in the plushest hotels of New York and Paris, and ride in chauffeured limousines. The audit had been ordered by one of Sam's old political enemies, Mayor Frank Rizzo. He also took grievance with Evans' purchase of personal stationery for $393. Sam Evans dropped out of public sight. He's nowhere to be found in the newspapers for the next few years, all through the bicentennial. He emerged again in 1978 as the self-styled godfather of black Philadelphia. And then he accused national black spokesperson Vernon Jordan of being a fellow traveler of the wealthy white establishment, the men who occupy the mahogany rooms of the mighty. Evans called for Jordan's resignation as chair of the Urban League. A few months later, Evans prepared and published a seven-point plan to end the Rizzo philosophy and rule of Philadelphia. African-American newspaper columnist Chuck Stone had his own issues with Sam Evans. In a February 1981 column, Stone spoke of, quote, that mythic black power broker, Samuel L. Evans. Evans, that wily, lovable, old political phony, has been ripping off the black community's leadership so long, they actually love him for it. But he is a guarantor of equality. Whites have their P.T. Barnum. Blacks have Sam Evans. Evans is symptomatic of a deficit especially acute in Philadelphia politics, the affliction of the ceremonial Negro leader. In my book, Black Political Power in America, I outline seven indices by which he can be identified and then write, he has been assigned honorific status because the white power structure knows he is safe. He is adept at posturing and working both sides of the racial fence with different agendas. In October 1981, only a few months after Evans had been slammed by columnist Chuck Stone, he was honored at a banquet featuring Chinese cuisine in the ballroom of the Academy of Music, and he was presented with a larger-than-life bronze likeness. The newspaper reporter made it a point to write, as usual with an Evans affair, details of the dinner were shrouded in mystery. But we do know that James Beard winning chef Susanna Fu was a personal friend, and that Sam had helped her set up her restaurant when she first came to town a couple of years earlier. That might explain the Chinese cuisine at the Academy of Music. 
Now people started to choose sides in the who is the real Sam Evans story. Constance Clayton, who served as superintendent of the school district of Philadelphia for 11 years, who also died in 2023. She's buried at Laurel Hill West. Clayton credits him with giving her a start in political action. Constance Clayton will get her own podcast one of these days. The cemetery likes to wait for five years after somebody dies before I can do a podcast about them. Despite still never having been elected to public office, Sam Evans stayed in the newspaper off and on for the rest of his life, and he lived to the astonishing age of 105 years. After his early years as an impresario, I could never figure out how he made a salary except by accepting positions with nonprofits and by suing people. He won a six-figure libel suit against the Philadelphia Tribune, the city's black newspaper, in May 1984. Earlier, the Tribune had published that Evans and Mayor Frank Rizzo had cut some political deals. Evans had won another six-figure settlement back in 1972 when he sued for back salary after Rizzo had him removed from overseeing the International Bicentennial Committee. In 1986, he was back to his old tricks. Sam Evans requested 40 acres of city parkland, and I have to wonder if that exact amount of acreage was chosen because of Union General William Tecumseh Sherman's special field order number 15 that was to allot that amount of land, 40 acres plus a mule, to all freed men. Sam intended to turn his 40 acres into an outdoor sculpture garden that would include 25 to 30 fountains, a $3 million wrought iron gate, a pyramid dedicated to, quote, the unknown African slaves, end quote, and a computer library of black history for the site, which was to be near Belmont Plaza. Evans also suggested placing statues of 288 black mayors from across the country who had been the first of their race to achieve that political position in their town or city. Estimated total costs was typical Evans. It was vague. He said probably going to cost between somewhere in 23 and, and $55 million. A follow-up article the next month has a reporter visiting his office where, quote, his voice mumbles and squeaks. He can't find anything he wants among the rhinoceros statues and pictures and papers strewn around his office. He's 83 years old and beginning to slow down just a bit. The writer noted some discomfort as Evans, quote, pulls his linebacker's bulk in a chair nearby for a close conversation. And again, this writer has a hard time figuring out how Sam Evans got his power and his reputation during his 50 years in Philadelphia. The conclusion? When all is said and done, Sam Evans is no man to trifle with. Another veteran of political turf wars with Evans said, What people in the black community respect him for and what makes him dangerous are his tenacity. He's like a pit bull. When he locks on to something, he just doesn't give up. People respect his ability to cause trouble. They steer clear of him. And the sculpture garden? Well, Belmont Grove remains unoccupied, except for picnickers and baseball players and cross-country runners. Till a couple of years ago, that's where the group The Roots had their annual picnic. Another AFNA program fell apart in 1986, and again the city picked up the tab of $200,000 to take the burden off of Sam and his organization. Less than three weeks later, when the city had not paid him the money, Sam turned around and sued the city. More and more people started to question his capabilities and his mental status. In 1987, he viciously slandered Councilwoman Joan L. Krajewski with some of the nastiest mud ever slung in Philadelphia. He put her in a category, quote, with Adolf Hitler, 
former Georgia governor Lester Maddox, George Wallace, and Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. Again, from Chuck Stone's column, his remark, continued the totally chastened Evans, was unfortunate nonsense for which I have no excuse. And he begged forgiveness. Krajewski forgave him. I find no announcement about the death of Sam's wife. His brother, the Reverend Dr. Perry Emanuel Evans, died at age 97 in 1993. Unlike his younger brother Sam, who had no formal education, Reverend Evans had a Doctor of Divinity from two universities and several honorary degrees. Reverend Evans is interred at Laurel Hill West in the South Lawn section. In June 2007, there was an ad in the Inquirer for an estate sale of the collection of Samuel L. Evans. He was alive. He was 104 years old, but he was selling off Chippendale, Empire, Federal and Victorian furniture, African-American paintings, glassware, porcelain. He had a German Beerstein collection, a lot of gold jewelry, and a lot of gemstones. On Friday the 13th, June 2008, Samuel London Evans died at an extended care facility in South Philadelphia. He was 105 years old. Words of praise poured in. Former Mayor W. Wilson Good. Sam Evans was a legend in this city for close to seven decades. He served presidents, governors, and mayors. Sam's friend Tommy Leonard said, I know Sam is probably pulling together St. Peter and saying, who's in charge here? If we could pull together a coalition, we could take over this place. Even his enemies readily acknowledged that he understood power, he grabbed it at every opportunity, and he wielded it to the benefit of many. But they continued to allege that he was a promoter whose chief production was himself. He wanted to control every aspect of any project brought to his attention, whether or not he created it. That he undermined anyone who dared to proceed without him, and that his ego led him to make arbitrary decisions that hurt his causes. His wake was at City Hall. Despite never having held public office, Sam was the first person in Philadelphia history to have a wake at City Hall. Samuel L. Evans was survived by a daughter, four grandchildren, ten great-grandchildren, and twenty-two great-great-grandchildren. I think Mayor Michael Nutter got the final word. He said his hand was in everything, his voice was heard everywhere. While you never really knew how much power he had, most of us never had the guts to find out. And the audience responded with chuckles and hallelujah. One of these days, somebody may write his full story, and we'll find out how much power he really had, and where it came from, and how he used it. I didn't have time to research Dr. Florence DeVita Johnson Reed, the Dean of Graduate Education at Cheney University. I want to spend a little bit of time on her, so I'm going to tell her story in a future podcast. In the mid-February edition of Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, I'll tell you of a Philadelphia event that can never be forgotten. Three members of the political group called MOVE are interred at Laurel Hill West, including the woman who owned the house on Osage Avenue that was bombed in May 1985. The March 2024 episode of All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories, is for Women's History Month. Beatrice Fenton was a sculptress, probably best known for her whimsical fountains, She is interred in an unmarked grave at Laurel Hill West. Elizabeth Duane Gillespie was a descendant of Benjamin Franklin and president of the Colonial Dames of America, 
and she's partly responsible for the establishment of Flag Day. She is in an unmarked grave at Laurel Hill East. Anna Justina McGee at Laurel Hill East is namesake for the rehabilitation hospital for which she contributed more than a million dollars. And if there's time, Seraph Deal, buried at Laurel Hill West, the woman who purportedly invented underarm deodorant. I will tell you about their importance in the growth of our nation next time on All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories. Laurel Hill East is located at 3822 Ridge Avenue in the East Falls section of Philadelphia. It's an easy walk from the bus stop at Ridge at Allegheny. Perceptive buses are 1 and 61. Admission is free, as is parking in the lot across the street, although the spaces are very limited. There is an app that you can download for a self-guided tour through its 78 acres. Laurel Hill West is at 225 Belmont Avenue in Bala Kinwood, with parking at the main entrance and at the bell tower. Your best bet for public transportation is to take the SEPTA Regional Rail to Maniunk, or one of the many buses to the Wissahickon Transfer Center on Ridge Avenue, then cross the Schuylkill River on the Pencoid Pedestrian Bridge and come up Writers Ferry Road to the entrance near the Pet Cemetery. If you download the audios I've done for self-guided tours, they're going to lead you on a 40 to 45 minute audio tour that talks about the people interred along the route through the cemetery. Both Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West are currently open from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. We welcome dog walkers and bike riders, photographers, painters, bird watchers, nature buffs, tree and plant lovers, skateboarders, and strollers, both the two-footed and four-wheeled variety. If you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, you get a daily reminder of our inhabitants and activities. You can also follow All Bones Considered on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. I've still got to check that out. <laughs> I haven't seen any of this stuff on TikTok. I'm 76 years old. How often am I going to look at TikTok? Once you've fallen in love with these hot spots, become a friend of Laurel Hill, and you'll have the opportunity for several members-only special tours conducted each year, including some inside the mausoleum visits. They may be cemeteries, but they are a couple of the liveliest spots in town. The key to finding the gift shop online, lots of good stuff in the gift shop. Check it out. Click on the support button and find the gift shop in the left-hand column. Our theme song, Names at Peace, was written and performed by local artist James Harrow. All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories and Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West stories are researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Dr. Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine at Temple University, whom you can reach through my email, joe at joelex.net. Remember to keep body and soul together until next time on All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories, where the plot thickens. Stick around to hear the references that I use for this podcast. Until the next time we meet, stay safe, stay well. Most of the information I got for this podcast came from newspapers of the day. I did use some other articles. There's one online for free from Temple University Libraries. It's an article called Civil Rights in a Northern City got a lot of good information. It even mentions uh, Sam Evans and who else is named that I see in this? Oh, yeah, Raymond Pace Alexander and his wife, CDTM Alexander. Another article. It's called Novel Public Policy, Pennsylvania's Fair Employment Practices Act of 1955. The Authors are Eric Liddell Smith and Kenneth C. Wolensky. This is from the Pennsylvania History, a Journal of Mid-Atlantic Studies, Autumn 2002, Volume 69, Number 4, pages 489 to 523. And then there's The Abolition of Slavery in Pennsylvania. Author is Edward Raymond Turner. It's from the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, 1912, volume 36, number 2, pages 129 
to 142. For Winnie Harris, everything came from the newspaper, starting in 1993 and ending with the sentencing of her killer 26 years later. She was a pretty amazing woman, and I'm glad I was able to share her story with you. Sam is scattered all over the newspapers from the 1930s to the 2000s, when he died in 2008. And there are skeptics, and there are people who worship at his feet, and it is really difficult to know how much of what I read about this fellow is opinion versus what is fact. He needs a biographer. He needs somebody to go out and interview Michael Nutter, John Street, some of the other people who worked with this amazing man for 30 or 40 years and find out what he was really like and write his true story. I think there is a big biography just waiting to be written. Okay, thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the podcast this month. Until next time, this is Dr. Joe Lex saying stay safe, stay well. See you around the cemetery.